Spring 2016 MJC Forensic Speech Night. My name is Ryan Guy, and I'm excited to see all of you. I'm the director here of MJC's Speech and Debate Team. Over the next hour and 15 minutes, we look to entertain and inform and excite you with a variety of different performances put on by MJC's award-winning Speech and Debate Team. MJC's Speech and Debate Team is one of the oldest speech and debate programs in the country as well as the state of California. Um, we have a little bit of a rivalry with Santa Rosa Junior College as to who technically started first, but I've got a really old piece of paper on the wall of our squadrons that says what it says, so that's my story. I'm sticking to it. The MJC Speech and Debate Team is a inter competitive intercollegiate speech and debate team, meaning that they spend weeks and weeks preparing to travel to tournaments all across the state and eventually the country where they compete against other schools and teams in a variety of both speech and debate events. The NJC Speech and Debate Program is freshly back this weekend from a very successful outing in Hayward where we took a first place sweepstakes award, which was pretty exciting considering that we beat every single other community college as well as four year university. So it's pretty exciting for us. In a moment, I'm going to introduce you to uh, our assistant director and the rest of the team, but I just want to do a couple of quick announcements. First off, I do have a lost and found item, a fancy green RHS keychain with what looks like a house key, possibly, or a, maybe like a building room key. So this belongs to someone. I'll leave it at that front table for you to grab it back. My guess is a few of you are here for your communication studies classes. Most communication studies professors ask that you fill out one of those critique forms, front and back, and bring that along with your ticket stapled to, to, them, uh, to them the next time you see them in class. So if you didn't get one of those forms, we have extra ones that you can grab on the way out, as well as a PDF copy of that form on mjcforensics.org, and we'll put that URL for you at the end of the show in case you need to go on there, check the event out, or rewatch the uh, video after the fact. Well, I'm excited to see you all, and at this point I want to go ahead and introduce you to the Assistant Director of Forensics, Ms. Professor Tori Shen. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, it is my joy and my privilege to introduce you to the MJC squad. Uh, so let's give them a round of applause. And Each 
each year, come October, individuals who are currently enduring breast cancer, as well as those who have survived it, experience what Laura Huffman, breast cancer survivor and writer for the Huffington Post, calls in her article access July 15, 2015, the dreaded pinkwashing assault. For these individuals, this month is filled with hundreds of products stamped with pink ribbons and a plethora of t-shirts proclaiming, save the tatas, I heart boobies, and even save second base. It is clear that campaigns such, such as these have a tendency to sexualize the concept of breast cancer and continue to objectify women with and without the deadly disease. An August 2014 study by Robin Turnblom of the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee states that the sexual objectification of women has become a dominant marketing tactic within breast cancer awareness marketing as a whole. After losing her book, close friend to metastatic breast cancer, Turquoise Brown, founder of the Hairless for Her Awareness Foundation, decided she'd had enough. Brown launched the Save the Women, Not the Boobies campaign in order to emphasize that society should be more concerned with saving the lives of these women, rather than simply their breasts. Through a viral marketing campaign picturing women proclaiming to save the women, not the boobies, this campaign makes an attempt to serve as a rhetorical alternative to the currently dominant campaigns. This campaign's alternate narrative leaves us with this research question. How does the Save the Women campaign rhetorically function against the currently dominant breast cancer awareness discourse? To answer this question, we must first examine the theory of narrative versus counter-narrative, then apply that theory to the Save the Women campaign, before finally determining the implications this campaign has on today's pink urban culture. In order to analyze Brown's campaign, we must first understand the rhetorical model of narrative versus counter-narrative. According to philosopher and rhetorical theorist Walter Fisher, narratives are a fundamental argument structure inherent to the human condition. As human beings, we make sense of our world through the telling and retelling of stories. Narratives in particular have a powerful rhetorical impact on us. Specifically, they can serve as a peripheral means of persuasion, often bypassing bias and, in some cases, logic. The problem arises in that the power of a narrative is not neutral. Certain messages are rooted in dominant hegemonic ideology. In other words, not all stories are created equal. Harold Lloyd Goodall advocated for a mechanism to challenge this problematic discourse, thus pointing the term counter-narrative. Counter-narratives, according to Goodall in his 2010 book, must meet five basic communication goals in order to be effective. These goals include speaking out against toxic messages and messengers, reframing keywords and phrases, using the power of personal stories to bring a face to the subject, creating an easily reproduced rhetorical vision, and speaking out when the media gets it wrong or only focuses on groups that threaten to take it backward. In the case of breast cancer awareness campaigns, the dominant discourse is that which is exemplified by campaigns such as Save the Tatas. With their campaign, Save the Tatas emphasizes the notion that society should be concerned with saving breasts rather than women. Christopher Duringer states in his 2013 article published in the Journal of Communication Inquiry, to the extent that it prioritizes women's sexual characteristics over the welfare of their entire persons, the Save the Tatas campaign may be funding research that saves women's lives, but its rhetoric seems decidedly anti-woman. Additionally, many of the dominant breast cancer awareness think campaigns tend to center on the common theme of the sexualization of women. Essentially, the fact that a woman's value is tied specifically to her sexuality. This leaves women who survive breast cancer via mastectomy wondering what value they have within a discourse that promotes the sexualized female breast as the primary concern for breast cancer activism. Brown's campaign is an attempt to respond to this dominant, destructive discourse. Now that we have an idea of how a counter-narrative must be constructed in order to be effective, let's apply Goodall's counter-narrative theory in analyzing the Save the Women campaign, first as a whole, and then broken down by content. Brown's campaign in itself does effectively serve as a counter-narrative in that it boldly speaks out against the toxic messages provided by campaigns such as Save the Chachas. Additionally, it creates an easily reproduced rhetorical vision of saving the whole woman that can be easily used in order to increase the amount of narratives that critique the dominant discourse. 
Many breast cancer awareness campaigns tend to rely on the problematic concept of fragmenting women's bodies. Erin Ann Vandenkort of Northern Michigan University states in her 2014 study, a perspective that may be useful in understanding breast cancer awareness campaigns is the objectification theory. According to this perspective, the female body is a socially constructed object to be looked at and evaluated. Women in a state of objectification have a tendency to internalize other people's opinions about their bodies and focus more readily on their appearance. Brown's campaign boldly speaks out against this toxic message, to emphasizing to society that we should take into account the woman as the human being she is, rather than simply what we have come to objectify. Beyond the campaign's overall message, the campaign's content has great significance to its effectiveness as a counter-narrative. When the campaign is first looked at, the eye is immediately drawn to the woman in the center of each photo. Each woman's chest is wrapped in bright pink Save the Women tape. The narrative, which was created because of a personal story about breast cancer, takes an interesting turn when the identity of the individuals pictured are radio and television personalities rather than survivors or patients of the deadly disease. The campaign also attempts to incorporate a boxing theme in order to depict women as, women as fighters. However, this is mitigated in two ways. First, the campaign's slogan rhetorically mitigates the theme by positioning women as a population to be saved. Second, the positioning of the women are static positions. The women are in full makeup and their hair is styled. The combination of the positioning and styling of the women causes the depiction of women as fighters to go, for the most part, unnoticed. Towards the bottom of select few posters, the phrase, because you can buy new ones, is spelled out in large bold font, emphasizing the idea that breasts are replaceable. Brown, in this case, is refraining from reframing the key concepts of the dominant discourse and that she's simply stating that a woman's sexuality can be renewed. As the eye makes its way to the bottom of the poster, it rests on the campaign slogan, Save the women, not the boobies. While Brown is attempting to increase the amount of, of narratives that critique the dominant discourse, she is indirectly positioning those women as a population to be saved. Finally, let's look to the implications this campaign has on today's being perfect culture. The Brown Save the Women campaign definitely is a strong attempt to combat the dominant discourse, and effectively, effectively does so in two ways. It's effective as a counter-narrative in that it boldly speaks out against the toxic messages provided by campaigns such as Save the Tatas, and creates an easily reproduced rhetorical vision that can be used with ease in order to increase the amount of narratives that critique the dominant discourse. What makes Save the Women ineffective, however, is that it relies on similar concepts of the dominant campaigns. The phrase, because you can buy new ones, only reinforces the concept of women of uh, sexual objectification and the idea that a woman's value is tied specifically to her sexuality. Additionally, Brown's Save the Women campaign may be in need of an alternative social action slogan, an alternative to the rhetoric utilized by Brown would need to empower women as agents of their own survival and eliminate the concept of sexual fragmentation. So today, we look at the Save the Women campaign and its implications on the patriarchal culture. First, we examine the theory of narrative versus counter-narrative, and we apply that theory to the Saved Women campaign. And finally, we determine the implications it had on today's pink ribbon culture. When we look back to the research question of how does the Saved Women campaign rhetorically function against the currently dominant breast cancer awareness discourse, we can see that it has an interesting relationship with the dominant discourse and that it boldly speaks out against the toxic messages, while at the same time relying on similar tactics to portray its message. Brown was right to be outraged at the currently dominant breast cancer discourse. Instead of engaging in the sexual objectification of women, we need to begin to engage in a rhetoric of empowerment. Thank you for that, Pat. Next up, we have Megan Chatelain. Her major is Communication Studies and Criminal Justice. Something fun about Meg, her favorite color is silver. 
Um, and Meg today will be giving a persuasive speech, which is a speech by the student designed to inspire, reinforce, or change the beliefs, attitudes, values, or actions of the audience. Please welcome Meg as she comes to do her persuasive speech. In August of 2014, a Texas tech group asked students on its campus who Brad Pitt was married to. They always responded correctly with Angelina Jolie. However, when asked who won the Civil War, the students responded alarmingly with the Confederates, the South, or I don't know. Well, if you don't know about things like the Civil War and slavery, then you wouldn't be able to understand why our society is the way it is today. Stated Raul Ceballos in a July 15, 2015 article in the Washington Post. Ceballos is the founder of the group asking the students the questions, and his statement couldn't come at a better time. Texas textbooks will now depict the Civil War as being based on states' rights and not slavery. With a total of 89 changes made to these textbooks, they have essentially changed an entire culture's history. We're going to take a look at this in three parts. The first is the problems that this is going to cause. The second, the causes that's actually going to cause those problems. And finally, we're going to take a look at some solutions that we can do to fix this issue. So first, let's open up the pages of these books and figure out what those problems are. The first is in 10, 2010, Texas changed the way that they did their academic curriculum by saying that they were going to make a more shift toward a conservative viewpoint because it was a political type of issue. So according to the Los Angeles Times on July 7th of 2015, they basically removed the Ku Klux Klan, downplayed slavery, and then swapped the terms hip-hop for country. The issue is that students returning to school receive an incomplete and inaccurate history. And that's 5 million students, according to the Huffington Post, on August 13th of 2015, in just Texas alone. The major problems with this is that students, when they become graduating citizens, they carry with them these retellings and leave behind context and history that they need in order to engage in current social issues, such as police brutality, with intelligence and empathy. Now, because of this, they're actually going to leave behind massive issues. See, the, the problem is, is that teachers are no longer required to teach the minimum academic curriculum. So teachers will leave out things like Brown versus Board of Education. Another problem is that the students who end up graduating end up having a skewed view of the way our history is made. Much the way it is now, as we've already jumped down the rabbit hole, by leaving behind the Japanese internment and Native American atrocities. So as we can clearly see, there has already been a massive shift toward this more conservative viewpoint. Now, let's take a look at some of these causes. We're going to flip to the first part of this book and find out the history of how we got there. See, the way they viewed it and what was quoted in Slade on November 15th of 2015 by Donna Bakarich saying that we need to make this massive shift because academia has already been skewed. The point is, is that this is definitely a political move, considering that the voting public who actually took place was majorly Republican. The problem is, is that Texas's review board does their own specific voting behind closed doors, not even actually asking the public their opinion. So anybody who was outraged by the fact that their history was being skewed didn't get their voice heard. Donna Baharich is the head chairperson of that Texas Board of Education, who is a main front runner in the one making these changes behind the textbooks. According to Slate, on December 15th of 2015, she said that by making this shift, they're adding a balance. Now the problem with this is that, well, there doesn't need to be a balance in our history because it should be factual and actually tell the truth, not the way we view it as a public. Which means that all they're doing is essentially whitewashing our culture and leaving out the things that are happening to the people of color. Now this is a massive problem because when they do this review process behind these closed doors and they actually leave out the individuals who would feel that they are being left out, they don't consider the implications of this as suggested earlier. Another problem that we're actually seeing with this massive issue that they're causing is that when it came to the voting process, according to a, 
Los Angeles Times article released in November on the 10th of this past year. Raul Cortez Jr., who represents Brownsville, Texas, say that, well, the, bo the board made the changes the night before, between 10 and 2 a.m. So they didn't know that most of these 89 changes were even being made. So that when they walked into the room, specifically the Democrats, they were completely left out of the loop and were not allowed to know what had happened until they were asked to vote. So when it came to the voting, they did vote for it. And while, in case you're wondering, it turned out 10 votes Republican to 5 votes Democrat on a 15-panel board member. So it's clearly a political issue. So now that we've seen what some of these causes are, let's actually figure out what we as students and instructors can do, the people in this very room, what we can stand up and actually do for this. The first is, as students, you don't have to buy these textbooks. You can actually buy textbooks that are accurate. A list of textbooks is provided here for you that do have these accurate and factual information that you would need. And as instructors, you don't have to actually buy the textbooks from Pearson's and Houghton Mifflin Company that are already biased. See, the issue with these textbooks is that they're actually so similar that states nearby Texas where these books are produced have to buy them because the states don't have a lot of time and resources to be able to delve deep into the research that they need to buy textbooks that would give you accurate information. So the list provided would help you with that. One such on the list is McGraw-Hill. Recently in December, there was a massive uproar with what had happened with McGraw-Hill. See, a student, one of us, stood up and said that they didn't like the way that slavery was being portrayed in their textbooks. McGraw-Hill had swapped the term slaves for immigrants just to kind of downplay that issue. The student was outraged and voiced it massively all over social media and everywhere, basically saying that this is wrong, so why would he buy a textbook that didn't include his accurate history? So McGraw-Hill, realizing that this was an issue, changed the term. They put the term slave back in, realizing that they had made a massive mistake. So just like this individual, we, uh, we can also stand up and make this change. Another step that we can do is to write to our congressional representative asking for him or her to make the board process across the nation the exact same. That way the processes are not biased or skewed in some manner. The step that we can actually look to is the way California does a review process. According to the Wall Street Journal on November the 13th of 2015, they discuss how different Texas Board of Education review process is compared to California. You see, California has a three-step review process where Texas only has the one. California starts off with what Texas does by having the actual review voters step in and say, are we going to keep it or not? Once Texas is done with that, they just kind of say, this is it, and hope people enjoy it, which they really haven't. California goes further and brings in content review experts who have doctoral degrees and PhDs and have gone to school to understand what the textbooks are meant to say and make sure that it is accurate. They go furthermore by inviting everybody in the public up to Sacramento for their open house to say, do you as people, students, teachers, parents, like what we're doing to the text? And if you say no, then they don't make the changes. If you say yes, then they do make the changes and keep the books. So you can write to your congressional representative, but you can also go to the review process and actually take part in that voting. So as we close the book on today, to figure out what actually has happened. We can clearly see that there's a massive issue with the way our history has been skewed. We can definitely see that we've already jumped down the rabbit hole the way we don't even discuss Japanese internment or the Native American atrocities. Furthermore, we can definitely do something about it by not buying the textbooks that have been skewed. We can buy textbooks that are accurate and do have a complete history. So when we think back to those students from Texas Tech who were portrayed in a video, well, they were fairly outraged at that video because they believed that they weren't accurately portrayed. See, they felt that they're smart and into smart people. They're able to do things. They do know who won the Civil War. Just the way we as individuals in this community should be outraged that textbooks are not factual. Essentially, the way that they've definitely changed our own history and have started whitewashing it.
think you made that fantastic persuasive speech. It's definitely something that, as an instructor, really makes you think. Uh, folks, we had a lot of people come in at the last moment. We need folks to go ahead, for fire code reasons, to find a seat. So if you're not currently sitting on the, in a seat or if you're on the floor, there's lots of seats around. You're going to have to go ahead and uh, find a spot to squeeze in. And again, if people wouldn't mind scooting towards the center, this lets us get people in a timely matter. So please, if you're one of those folks, hide it out in the back. Please come forward and find one of the uh, one of the chairs. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate that. style debate. One of the fun characteristics of a parliamentary debate, well, at least fun for those of us watching, is that it's a form of limited preparation debate, meaning that the debaters don't know what they're going to be debating until 20 minutes before the topic is announced. And that's what we're going to do now. So in a moment, I'm going to release what's known as the resolution. And these four debaters up here on the stage are going to head back to the back room and spend the next 20 minutes doing research and attempting to put arguments. But before we can do that, to make it even more fun, they don't know if they're going to be arguing for the topic or against the topic. So, Lily, if you'd be so kind to call the coin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what you see. <laughs> and it is heads. It was heads. <laughs> this is Rick's lucky nickel. What would you guys like? Affirmative or negate? Uh, the, the negation. Negative. All right. So Cody and Whitney will negate. Casey and Lily will affirm the following resolution in 20 minutes. Resolved. Donald Trump has done irreparable harm to the Republican Party. They seem excited about it. Good luck, debaters. Good prep. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the floor back over to our Masters of Ceremony to tell you a little bit about our next event. Thank you. His major is secondary education with an emphasis in math. His fun fact, his life goal is to be the sp old, old Spice spokesman because he's the man that your man can smell like. <laughs> I like ass. And I refuse to say that today. Um, so we will be inviting Rick up to do a dramatic interpretation piece. And this is a heading that represents one or more characters from a play or plays of literary merit. So please give it up for Rick as he counts to do this dramatic interpretation. I stand up and you, and the toughest gig I ever had to do was in lawyer's office in Dublin. This was early December 2010, and the timing is important because around this time Ireland was broke, and 80 years of independence had been given out for a property boom, and foreign creditors were in the country telling us how to spend our money. But I was feeling quite different at the time. You see, I had bought a house at the height of the boom, and it had fallen down in value to almost nothing. But I'd managed to channel my rage into humorous commentary on the economy, and everybody wanted to know the lighter side of the financial crisis. 
As comedian Jack Handy once said, before you criticize someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes. That way, when you criticize them, you're a mile away from them and you have their shoes. <laughs> Jokes like this highlight the tension between social threat and our self-concept. A study done by UCLA concluded that threats to the social self produce feelings of low social worth. This feeling has profound impact on an individual's life, resulting in negative relationships, depression, as well as impaired academic and job performance. This can, uh, can lead to self-destructive behavior according to the University of Texas Counseling and Mental Health Center. The following piece illustrates a comedian and a property developer who both struggle with feelings of low social work. The Balance of Comedy by Colin Murray. On the train to Belfast, I rang my wife to see what I need new emails. I was quite an obsessive email checker. Colin rang half an hour ago, Lax, but I'll check again. She checked, and there was a new email, and I didn't recognize the name of the person it was from, so I got excited. This could be a corporate gig, which is the holy grail of gigs for comedians. So, she skimmed Reddit. Blah, 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 it's an event on the 3rd of December, blah, 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 Gross Lake Foundry, blah, 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 some substantial damages. Call them. Well, it seems they're suing you for a joke you told. What on earth did you say? Well, immediately, I flashed back to that Facebook thing. I was doing a lunchtime gig for a group of businessmen, comfortably well off people, men in their 50s and 60s. The kind of demographic you want to name an anti prostate cancer campaign at. <laughs> the gig was going well, they liked my stick about the economy, and I joined with them because we're all looking for someone to blame. My idea was to blame the billboards that line the property developments all around the country. The billboards that wanted you to buy an apartment by showing you the idea of the lifestyle you'd be buying into, by, selling you, uh, by showing you the photographs of the kind of people who would be your neighbors once you moved in. The photographs were often of a man who looked a wee bit like George Clooney. His tightly cropped hair flesh with gray, putting on cufflinks to a charity ball perhaps. Or a sexy woman eating some sexy food suggestion. <laughs> Maybe a bit of asparagus. This was six years ago, so asparagus was still sexy for us in Ireland. <laughs> what they were trying to say was that if you bought an apartment, one or both of these people, depending on your clipity, would take you in and have sex with you on the fly. That's the lifestyle they're trying to tell you. <laughs> And then I told one particular joke about one particular property developer. I identified him by name and I didn't realize he was in the room at the time. For legal reasons, I can't tell you what the joke was, so you're just going to have to trust me when I say it was really funny. He came up to me after the show when we exchanged on pleasantries, and then he walked away and I told us that or that. But as it turns out, he was walking away to his lawyer's office to send me a letter. So here I was, on a train to Belfast, listening to that letter being read out. And I was scared. Uh, you see, I had recently left my job to become a full-time stand-up comedian, and uh, I suddenly felt very alone. That's the scariest. There's lots of scary situations you'll encounter in life that day. Uh, when you leave your job and you're just out on your own, and then you get sued. That's that's pretty scary. And then I felt enraged. I felt he was bullying me with the lawyer's letter, and in the lawyer's letter they said things like, what you said went far beyond bounds comedy. I had imagined a lawyer and a property developer sitting in a room somewhere with a whiteboard trying to figure out the bounds of comedy. <laughs> but I felt bullied. I felt intimidated. And how dare they clamp down on my free speech. Oh, and then I got excited. This could be my big chance for publicity. I could go to court with this and strike a blow for art against money. I would be David and they would be glad. So, 
I'd be in court with all the big shot city lawyers. And for some reason, against all the rules of jurisprudence, the judge would allow me to address the court for 15 minutes. And I would change minds. There would be spinning headlines the following day that said things like, Financial security for hitherto unknown comedian as TV deal is offered. So, I went to my lawyer's office, and I told him the story. I told him the way that I'm telling you now, in a kind of offhand way. Colin, I need you to tell me exactly how you said it, because if this goes to court, we need to be able to convince the judge what you said was funny. <laughs> so, I stood up at the edge of the table, and as they say, I have done some tough gigs in my day, but oof, 20 minutes in front of the lawyer who didn't nod or smile once just took notes, and from time to time interrupted to legally clarify some of the jokes I was telling. <laughs> well, when I was finished, he gave me the toughest review I have ever had as a comedian. Colin, I think we have difficulty persuading a judge what you said was funny. I think he has a case for defamation, and I think you should apologize. I was furious! How can I roll back on this? This is art fighting against money. How can I apologize? If this goes to court, it could cost you 250,000 euro. Okay, I'll apologize. <laughs> Needless to say, I was deflated by the whole experience. And I went home, and I fell down because this was not how this was supposed to end. The glorious story of the little guy fighting the big guy. And all because it was going to cost me. I was going to have to re-roll on my principles. And then I reread the letter. And I read it, and I read page two of the letter. On page two, I noticed this line which said several others who were there that day also pointed out the serious nature of your allegations to my clients. And that's when I realized that perhaps what was going on here wasn't this battle with this press free speech, but the fact that this man had been slagged off and laughed at in front of his people by his peers. And he was just playing hard. And I realized that it's not necessarily always the little guy versus the big guy. Not necessarily that the little guy is always right. Because I had thought to myself, I was fighting the man. But, as it turns out, I was just fighting a man. And that's not funny, as it turns out. Sometimes David might have been a bit of an asshole. <laughs> and Goliath might have just been minding his own business.
30 seconds used. One minute used. Someone called her just not a good person. Now, this girl's name is Ivana Lynch, and many of us might know her as the young girl who played Luna Lovegood in the Harry Potter series. Now, this brings me to the quotation today, give and forget, receive and remember, from an unknown author. And what I think the author is trying to articulate to us today is that it's important to forget our wrongdoings and remember kindness. Now, we're going to look at this through three points of analysis. The first one being the Disney movie, The Little Mermaid. The second point being the Harry Potter series. And then the third point being a book called Call of the Wild. So let's dive into the sea and look at Ariel and The Little Mermaid. And we see a 16-year-old girl who is very upset at her father because she won't let, or he won't let her date who she wants to. Now, I'm sure many of us have been in that situation before and can relate. And throughout this story, we are able to see that her father does not believe that she is worthy to become a human, that she is not kind enough to become a human, and that she's not smart enough to make her own decisions. And even though she's 16 years old, she does realize that, no, she can make this decision herself. Now, we all know how the story ends. She ends up getting legs. She goes through this terrible process of getting legs. But that's beside the point. What we're looking at, at is at the end of the story, the Little Mermaid, also known as Ariel, is on land with the prince of her dreams, literally the prince of her dreams. And she is there on her wedding day, and her father comes up out of the ocean. And throughout that entire time period, she was upset at her father for not believing she was smart enough to make her own decisions. But she lets go of his wrongdoing and now relinqu or relishes in, in his kindness on that day when he ultimately brought her to the man of her dreams. Now, if that's not forgetting wrongdoings and remember kindness, I don't really know what is. Now let's hop on a broomstick and fly into the wizarding world of Harry Potter. And we see a young man named Harry Potter who is, as the story we're gonna talk about right now, about 14 or 15 years old. And he has just been, he has just found out that Lord Voldemort is back and the Wizarding World is doomed. And throughout this time period, he is faced with the criticism of, you're a liar, you have no idea what you're talking about, what is wrong with you? And throughout this time, he loses many friends. He loses many people who once believed in him. But he doesn't change his mind and he doesn't say that he is a liar because he knows he is not. He knows what he saw is true and that Lord Voldemort did kill Cedric Diggory. And at the end of this book, we see that everyone who once thought that he was a liar now believes him, but he doesn't hold that against them. He takes his friends back and he puts himself out there again. And he, all, as all we all know, ends up saving the world. But what it comes down to is that he was able to forget everybody's criticisms and remember the kindness that they showed him before. Now let's look at the Jack London book called Call of the Wild. And in this book we see, in a wolf's perspective, a wolf that was taken away from his owners at a very young age of a pup. And throughout this story we see that he is very reluctant 
to become friends with the other wolves or become friends with other human beings because he knew such great despair when he was taken away from his family. And throughout this entire book, we see him growing as a wolf and he eventually becomes the lead sled dog. And we are able to see that he is able to build relationships with other people and other dogs as well. So therefore, he was able to forget the wrongdoing of being taken from his owners and eventually creates a relationship with the people that took him that helped him get to where he is today as the lead sled dog. So today I received a quotation, give and forget, receive and remember from an unknown author. And I said that the author was trying to articulate to us, it's important to forget wrongdoings and remember kindness. And I agree with this quotation. I showed you this through three points of analysis. The first one being the little mermaid and how she was willing to forgive her father and basically took her prince back that she wanted. And then we looked through the eyes of Harry Potter and how he was able to forget all the criticisms people showed him and remember the kindness that they once showed him before. And then we looked at Call of the Wild and the wolf and how he was able to forget being taken from his owners and was able to build a healthy relationship with the people that took him. So now let's look back at Alana Lynch. And she was able to forget every bad thing people to told her when she, they called her fat or ugly or that she wasn't good enough. And she was able to become a very successful act actress in one of the most successful movie series that we all know.
has a mass following. People aren't going out to vote just because he's Donald Trump. People go to the rallies because he's Donald Trump, and that's about it. So when he has a large polling following, it's mainly just because he is Donald Trump. Now the main problem with that is, is people are saying like the only reason that the Republicans have a chance in the voting polls and getting the right number of people out to elect a president is due to the number of people who are showing up right now to the polls. That doesn't happen if Donald Trump does not get the nomination. This is a major problem for the Republican Party. The other major problem is the fact that if he does get the nomination, then he has to now deal with the fact that all the Democrats who really hate him are going to go out there and vote so he doesn't win, basically guaranteeing the win for the Democratic Party. So either he gets the nomination, in which case he won't win because the Democrats are going to flood the, to the polls to make sure he doesn't win, or he doesn't get the nomination and all of his following doesn't show up to the polls because they're going to sit at home and cry about the fact that their candidate didn't get the nomination. Here, here. Either way, it's almost a guaranteed presidential nomination and for the Democratic Party. According to CNBC, they say that polls are up 20% since Donald Trump has entered. So Donald Trump is bringing 20% more people to the polls. On to our second point about how he has done more irreparable harm. The second point is going to be the fact that his choice of ad hominem attacks. He is verbally abusing many people from many different places for no reason at all. His verbal abuse stands to hurt the image of the Republican Party because it makes the Republican Party look like, frankly, a bunch of people whining about things that are wrong instead of actually taking any kind of action. So. When you have this kind of ad hominem fallacy attacks on people, uh, attacking candidates as like Jeb Bush, as well as attacking whole entire races of groups like the Mexican people, you see that this is a terrible, this is, a, it's just terrible. Like, <laughs> it's to the point where it's not repairable to the Republican Party. There's, there's no coming back from that. The words have already been said, the words have already been plastered throughout all of the United States as well as the world. He's been banned in countries throughout the world saying we don't want that kind of person here. Like this is irreparable damage. There's no way to come back from that. And at the point where it is irreparable damage, you're always going to be voting for the affirmative because that is what it's our burden to do, is to show that it is irreparable damage. Thank you. Now recognizing the leader of opposition for a constructive speech not to exceed five minutes. And if you wouldn't mind giving us an off-time roadmap, that would be fantastic. So I'm going to start with why explaining how he has not done any harm that cannot be fixed, and then I'll go on and explain how what they explain, if that makes sense, can be fixed. Ready? Everyone ready? Ready. So starting with, I have to explain that it is, as the negation team, it is not our burden to show that Donald Trump, whether or not Donald Trump has or has not done any harm. It is our, only our burden to show that it can be fixed. So going on from that, the only, everything Donald Trump has done as a presidential candidate to the Republican Party can be fixed, mainly because he is only a candidate at this point. Donald Trump is just talking. He's not in office first. He has no power and cannot take any action from any action with the current position he has. At this point, as soon as he as soon as he drops out, as soon as he loses, whether it's now or at the end of the Republican at the end of the race, whenever that happens, no one's going to remember about Donald Trump. Everything that he's done is going to go away. We've had bad. We've had. We've had worse people in the past run for president, run for president for either Republican or Democrat. People have had a lot to say about them. But after the race, in the aftermath, no one actually, in the next race, no one actually remembered what this prior person has, did, has done. They all focused on the current presidential, presidential candidates. And another point on this is, um, in, at the Iowa caucus, Ted Cruz beating him out. This is showing that there's a shift away from the from Donald Trump as a Republican candidate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Meaning already the things he's done, the things he are saying, people are realizing that they're offensive. People are realizing that he's wrong, he's not the right person for the Republican Party candidate. 
showing right now a fix in this in the things he is causing for the Republican Party. And again, after my point for 2006, after this race, after 2016, Donald Trump will not be remembered. The things he has said, the things he has done, will not be remembered. Going on to what they were talking about, the first thing they talked about is voting numbers. They, Donald Trump is causing this massive increase in voting numbers. And this is either going to cause him to become the Republican candidate, and the Democrats will obviously win because this will cause a rush of Democratic voters, or that Donald, or that he won't win, and then all the Donald Trump voters, all the people who are voting for Donald Trump, won't show up to vote. But they failed to show how this caused any harm. They didn't show how the, having a Democratic president would be a bad thing. They just said the Democratic president would obviously win. This shows no harm in our society. This shows no harm in what is happening, and it shows no harm that anything Donald Trump is saying will stay forever with the Republican Party. This just shows. They, in the presidential candidate, in the race right now, Democrats are expected to win. There's no harm in this. On to the next point, they say that he is verbally abusing people from so many different places. And it's making the Republicans look bad in that way. But it's not, because when people think of Donald Trump, they're not thinking of the Republican Party, they're thinking of Donald Trump. They're not saying the Republican Party is offensive. They're saying Donald Trump himself is offensive. No one else in the Republican Party, party is, a, is verbally abusing people. Only Donald Trump is verbally abusing people. That, this, is a, this is a thing that is uniquely happening just with him, with no one else. And again, after Donald Trump wins, or not wins, loses, or after he drops out, after this race, Donald, none of these things will be remembered. It will go on to the next presidential candidate, whoever that may be. They say that there's no coming back from words, but after this, no one will remember these words. They won't matter because Donald Trump has no power. He's not running for president anymore. He'll drop out. Whatever happens in the end, nothing that has happened with Donald Trump as a Republican Party will stay with the Republican Party forever. Worse, were there, like, as I mentioned, there have been worse Democrat, there have been worse presidents for both parties, but none of those have been remembered prior to this. As again, everyone's focusing on Donald Trump. No one's bringing up these old arguments. They're bringing, they're focusing on the current presidential elections. In four years the next, at the next Republican, or at the next presidential election, no one's gonna say, don't vote for the Republican Party because four years ago, Donald Trump was running. They're gonna say, whichever people, they're gonna focus on those presidential elections. They're gonna focus on the people running then, not on who's running now. Nothing that Donald Trump has done is permanent. It's all going to go away as soon as Donald Trump drops out, loses, whatever happens. That's the point I'm trying to explain. Is that nothing Donald Trump has done will be permanent. Thank you. All right. Now recognizing the member of government for a constructive speech, not to exceed five minutes. And please also give us an off-time road back. Thank you. All right, so we're going to start with their off-case argument and then move on case. So that is my road map. All right, partner ready? Opposition ready? Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay, let's get started. So let's start with reviewing the, uh, our resolution. Donald Trump has done irreparable harms to the Republican Party. Let's keep that in mind. Irreparable harms to the Republican Party. We are not debating whether he has done irreparable harms to America. All right, let's move on to their on-case, to their off-case arguments. So they say that we, um, that as soon as he drops, everyone is gonna forget about Donald Trump. Let's talk about Donald Trump for a second. We have never, seen a candidate like Donald Trump. Has anyone seen a candidate that has more Twitter followers than Donald Trump? Donald Trump is not going to let this down. We will be reminded for the rest of his life that he almost won the Republican nomination. <laughs> Donald Trump is unlike any Republican candidate that we have ever seen. So that they are saying that because of past occurrences, we are not going to remember this? Donald Trump is not going to let us down. We know that. All right, so because of that, their whole disadvantage that we're not going to remember in the future because of that, you can close through and you're going to see that we will be seeing a lasting impact because of this. All right, moving on to our on-case arguments. So 
we talked about the harms that it is doing to the Republican Party, and that one of these is the voter turnout that is going to be happening. He says that we don't do not show the harm for this. We clearly showed that if Donald Donald Trump has such a massive following that people are going to be flowing to the election, more people are polling because of him. If Donald Trump does not win the nominee, these people that are, are increase in polling will see no reason to get off the couch that day and go vote. Also, if Donald Trump does win the nomination, we are going to see a Democratic backlash because people are going to be so scared of Donald Trump. And then he goes on to say that what's so bad about Democra Democrats? We are not talking about that right now. Again, remember the resolution, harm to the Republican Party. A harm to the Republican Party would be the Democratic Party winning. All right, moving on to our next. So we are talking about the ad hominem attacks that Donald Trump has done to candidates and to groups of people alike. So when it, he says that when people think of the Republican Party, they do not think of Donald Trump. The most outspoken people that are signed with the Republican Party are Donald Trump voters. You are, they are going to be posting the ones on Facebook. They are going to be posting the ones on social media and activating. Donald Trump has such a passionate following that people are going to be forced to be thinking about him whenever they see the Republican Party. Donald Trump is putting so much effort into his campaign, putting so much money into it, that to disregard that he has any effect is ridiculous. And then we are moving, and then we, he goes, they go on to say that, so because of this, we're going to look at what he has said about people. He has attacked all of the Republican candidates on very personal issues that are not something that you debate on stage. Heaven, if you guys watch the GOP debate, you are not seeing debates on policies, you are seeing debates on who can kick the other guy in the shin hard. So what, is, what we are seeing from these Republican debates, what are we seeing in the Republican world? is abuse. We are seeing people calling each other names, calling groups of people awful things. You hear them call certain groups of people racist, uh, rapists and criminals and drug people that are bringing drugs into our country. He totally disregards a whole group of people that bring such wonderful contributions to our society. What does he call them? Criminals. This is not something that we want to that we want the Republican Party to be thought of. So you're going to be voting for the affirmative today because we show clearly what Donald Trump is doing to the Republican Party. We talked about how he has such a crazy following that if he doesn't get the nomination, we're going to be seeing backlash from people that are such passionate followers. And then if he does get the nomination, we're going to be seeing backlash from the Democratic Party and how both of these things hurt the Republican Party and will have a poor voter turnout from Republicans on election day. And then we move on to talk about how his verbal abuses show, uh, depict the Republican Party as abusers. So today, you will be voting for the affirmative because we clearly show what Donald Trump is doing to our Republican Party. Thank you very much. All right, now recognizing the member of opposition for a constructive speech, not to exceed five minutes. So first I'm going to tell you why Donald Trump isn't doing irreparable harm, and then I'm going to address the arguments made by the affirmative which says he is doing harm. So is everyone ready? Yeah. yeah. Let's start. Okay, again, I just want to point out that as the negative team, it is not our burden to say that Donald Trump has or hasn't done any harm, because he has. He has done harm, and we don't agree with the things we do that he does, and we don't support these things, and it's not our job to say whether we do or do not support the things that he's done. It is our job as a negative to show that the things that he has done can be repaired, because for one, uh, an argument that uh, the affirmative dropped today was the fact that Donald Trump isn't even in power yet. Here, here. He is just a bunch of words, and we all know that words are 
are nothing unless there are actions behind them. And so far there has been no actions behind the words that Donald Trump has said. They are just Donald Trump being Donald Trump. Uh, the second point that went, un, uh, that went unresponded to by the affirmative team is the fact that in the Iowa caucus, Ted Cruz beat out Donald Trump. So therefore we see this shift of people realizing that Donald Trump isn't the best candidate and we see the shift going towards Ted Cruz. So we already see that these harms that are being done are being repaired by the American people that are correcting them. We are correcting these harms ourselves by realizing that these things are not appropriate for a candidate to do. And yes, as a negative, we agree that these things are appropriate, but we agree that they can be fixed because we're already seeing them be fixed in the Iowa caucus. Um, going on to um, the point that after 2016, Trump isn't going to be remembered. The affirmative puts its argument on it saying that Donald Trump has a bunch of Twitter followers. And he's the first candidate that has a bunch of Twitter followers and all these arguments like that. And the thing is, um, I'm pretty sure Obama would probably have Twitter followers in 2008 if Twitter was extremely popular as it is now. Like, he would have the same amount of support, just like Donald Trump does. I'm sure if you looked at Facebook in 2008, he would probably have the equivalent to Donald Trump's Twitter followers on Facebook. So, because our times are changing, that means no, uh, that's no issue in this case. Twitter isn't even a relevant issue in this case. Going on to the affirmatives case, they're saying that the um, voting numbers are um, going higher because people vote, because the people are voting, because he's Donald Trump, and it's a problem uh, for the Republicans, and that the Democrats will have this vote so he doesn't win. Um, again, they didn't address how this is a harm in this case, and they have no proof, even if a Democrat does win, there's no proof that a Democrat is going to win. So they can't say that this Democrat is going to be a harm to the Republican Party, because who's to say Ted Cruz isn't going to win? Who's to say Marco Rubio is not going to win? It's just these, these uh, uns, uh, unsupported arguments that are being made, and there's a 50-50 chance that a Republican's going to win, and a 50% chance that a Democrat's going to win. We have no say in this matter. There's two parties, it's 50-50. Going on to the um, fact that uh, uh, there's verbal abuse and it hurts the image of the Republican Party. But again, like my partner said, when you think of Donald Trump, you don't think of the whole Republican Party. You think of Donald Trump because Donald Trump is going to be Donald Trump. That's just who he is. And it is unacceptable. And it's our job to change that by voting in these elections and getting uh, taking the shift away from his publicity. Um, they're saying that Donald Trump, uh, that uh, in these debates, that Donald Trump is just throwing ad hominem arguments and attacking everybody. But I'm pretty sure people attacked Carly Fiorina Arena in the debates as well. People have attacked Ted Cruz. People have attacked Hillary Clinton on her privacy scandals. People have attacked everybody. All these debates are is a game show now in the eyes of Americans because it's just people attacking people. And the way that we can fix this is to realize that we need to make a shift and repair these harms ourselves. So if we take action and we actually vote for people who need to repair these harms, yeah, we will repair them. And an example, again, is the Iowa Congress. Ted Cruz beat Donald Trump. That is step one. And if we keep progressing this way, then Donald Trump won't be remembered, and we will have a great nation. And that's why you'll be voting for the night today. Recognizing the leader of opposition for a rebuttal speech not to exceed two minutes. And just remember, no new evidence or no new arguments, excuse me, will be brought up in the rebuttal speech. Everyone ready? Yeah. So, sorry today, you're gonna be voting for Ned mainly because the affirmative team has not has not showed any proof that Donald Trump has has made any kind of harm. It will stay with the Republican Party forever. 
first on the point that my partner talked about, that we are correcting ourselves. The things that Donald Trump are do is doing, we are correcting this in society for ourselves, as shown in the Iowa caucus, where Ted Cruz beat Donald Trump. This is clearly, very clearly, that Donald Trump is losing support. This is very clear evidence that Donald, the things that Donald Trump saying are, are horrible. They are bad, and people are realizing this. This is show proof that our society is realizing this, and that's a correction in itself. And for what, the, for what the affirmative team was saying, one, for the, one of these they're saying is we're talking about the GOP debate. Everyone's doing that. They're going to come up here, they're going to come up here, and they're going to try and say this, this, it was caused by Donald Trump. But it wasn't. They've been doing that. That's how it's been working for a while. Yes, it's bad, but that was not caused by Donald Trump. That was caused by the political society that we are, we are in. That was not caused by Donald Trump. And then the other part where they say, um, that no matter what's going to happen, the Democrats are going to win. That's bad for the Republican Party. There's still evidence Ted Cruz can win. Mark Rubio can win. It can still be either one, depending down on it. Just because Donald Trump doesn't have to, just because Donald Trump doesn't win the Republican vote, no matter that doesn't mean that the Republican Party will lose. There are still other voters out there. There are still other other Republican candidates out there that can still win. They have shown that there is no there is no evidence they have given you today that has shown that anything that Donald Trump has done will be permanent. As soon as he loses, as soon as he drops out of the race, whatever happens, everything that Donald Trump has said or done will be forgotten. Thank you. Now recognizing the Prime Minister for a rebuttal speech not to exceed three minutes. Are we ready? Yeah. yeah. All right. Alright, so just remember, as the affirmative team, it is only our burden to show that what he has done won't be able to be repaired. Like, the damage is done, can't come back from it. It's all we have to show if they've proven otherwise, and by all means vote for them. But, they have it. Alright. <laughs> Moving on to our first point about why there's, why the damage is already done. The Republicans, the chance of them getting a president nominated this year to actually become the elected president of the United States is now very, very slim due to the fact that Trump has stayed in the race so long. As I pointed out in my very first speech, the fact that he stayed in the race so long, he started to gain actual supporters, which is weird, but with those actual supporters, when he, if he doesn't get the nomination, people are not going to go to the voting booths to vote. They're gonna be like, well, my candidate didn't, isn't in the race, so I don't care anymore. Like, that's those people who are voting for Trump right now in the primaries. Those are the people going to the polls to support Trump because he's Trump. Now, when those people don't go to the polls, they, the Republican Party no longer has enough people to just beat out Hillary Clinton or even Bernie Sanders if they get the nomination. The second major point is the fact that Trump won't let America forget. Like, every single time election season comes up, Trump's not gonna let people forget about it, which means there's already irreparable damage. Like, it's, it's done. Like, every single time election season come up, Trump is going to blow in people's faces like, hey, remember that time I was leading the Republican Party for like six months? You guys remember that? That was pretty cool, huh? Like, that's the kind of thing that Trump's gonna do. He's gonna throw it in people's faces on, for the end of time. And not only that, but TV channels are going to be running these smear campaigns every single time the Republicans have a credible candidate. We'll be like, yeah, okay, we're going to trust the new Republican candidate when they brought out Trump. Like, every single time you're going to see late night TV shows throwing flashbacks to Donald Trump for the next hundreds of years where people are just making a giant joke out of it. But when it's a giant joke, the Republican Party loses creditation. And when they're no longer credible, that hurts the party, even if it's just slightly. Donald Trump has hurt the Republican Party. Their only real argument is about how he didn't uh, win in Iowa, but keep in mind he came in second in Iowa, and this was after calling everybody in Iowa stupid. <laughs> like, that's, though, that's like, so he's not even gonna care, like, oh man, I got second, yeah, but I just called the whole entire group stupid and I got second. So he's gonna count that as a complete win, and he's gonna throw it probably right now, actually, in everybody in Iowa's face right now, saying, I called you guys stupid, you still voted for me. Like, that's the kind of person Donald Trump is. This is irreparable damage to the Republican Party, which is why you're gonna be voting for the affirmative team today. Thank you. Can I get one more big round of applause for this? Well, 
You've heard the arguments and it's good to enjoy a debate. However, debates do have winners and losers, so we're going to do a little audio poll of the audience. So, at the end of the round, considering the arguments you've heard, if you feel that the negative has sufficiently proven their arguments that Donald Trump has not done irreparable harm to the Republican Party, let us hear it now. believe that the affirmative team has proven their case and that Donald Trump has indeed done irreparable harm to the Republican Party. Let us hear your voice. <laughs> that, that's a tough one for me. I guess we're just going to have a call at a time. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>